Chapter 3, The Art of Transformation You see, that's why I really work like a dog, and I have worked like a dog all my life. I am not interested in the academic status of what I am doing because my problem is my own transformation. That's the reason also why when people say, well, you taught this a few years ago and now you say something else. My answer is, well, do you think I work like that all those years to say the same thing and not be changed? Foucault. With this chapter, I will approach the main topic of this book, the art of transformation. Already from this title, it is possible to glean the crucial question that will now need to be addressed. Why is it an art of the self that is aimed for, and what might this concept of art look like and entail? I will raise this concern as an initial move right at the very beginning. Secondly, the question of transformation will be approached here. What does it mean to speak of a subjectivity in transformation? Which are possible precedents for such a view, and how does such a transformation figure in an art of the transpersonal self? Those are the guiding questions for this chapter, which will commence by taking a closer look at the aspect of art in the practice of the self. 3.1. Science and Art Quote since I grew tired of the chase and search, I learned to find, and since the wind blows it in my face, I sail with every wind. Nietzsche. So far I have, without further clarifying the point, spoken about the transformation of the self as a form of art. Before making any further advances in this study, the question of art so needs to be addressed. The guiding frame will derive from the following questioning. Firstly, why and how is it that this work of self on self might be conceptualized as an art? And secondly, which understanding of art can one follow in this instance? In order to clarify this point, I will thirdly establish the relation of art to two other figures, science and handicraft work, in order to retake also a general point about the Apollonian and Dionysian and distinguish this understanding of art from other possible ways of conceptualization. This will ultimately enable a reconnection with some of the findings of the previous chapters. In one of his major treaties on the questions of art, Aesthetic Theory, published posthumously, Theodore Adorno keeps recurring to the enigmatic feature of art, the inexplicability of any work of art. This inexplicability, this elusiveness, which sets in the very moment one believes one has finally grasped a work of art, makes it slip away again at this very instant. This leads Adorno to the conclusion, which is so vexing for the theoretical mind, that a work of art can never be completely deciphered. All artworks, all art altogether, are enigmas. Since antiquity, this has been an irritation to the theory of art. Adorno. Indeed, it is this enigmaticalness which for Adorno makes a work a piece of art. With a work of art, he asserts, one is never finished as it presents different faces each time one beholds it and never stays the same. Each understanding just gives way to a new questioning. Otherwise, without this enigmatic element, one might presume following Adorno, it remains a handicraft, or at its worst, kitsch. A piece of handicraft might be executed technically perfect, however, without that additional enigmatic quality, it will not become a work of art. Against the German saying, Kunstkumpfund können, one can so point out, after Adorno, that just technical perfection and know-how do not make for a work of art. This saying would, 
as will be established in the following, for the current purposes, need to be qualified through a different emphasis. Art is not just a work, it is not just a craft. It is, in the rendering proposed here, also a work. Each work of art in some way recounts for this other and elusive element, making a piece of work a work of art, sometimes without even the intention or knowing of the artist. The cognitive realization of what exactly he, she is doing is not in each case necessary for an artist to create a work of art and may even hinder or block the process. Now, this does not imply that a certain element of work, knowing how to handle one's tools, the element of aesthetics and style in the work of art is not significant, for it can be, indeed, very important and crucial, but style and distinction alone do not make a work of art. Only by letting the aesthetic element fade at the crucial moment towards the possibility of a transformation and creation of something different and unexpected, can a piece of art emerge. Each piece of art, so, has an aesthetic component, a component of style, but it is not purely aesthetic. Art, I would suggest, in this sense, cannot be cognitively willed. The work of an artist is also a work, but it is not only a work. From this perspective, it so does not follow that only the most strenuous exercise, the most rigid of practices and greatest of complexities will lead to art. Art might just as well be found in the lightest and easiest stroke of a brush or the most fleeting tone of music. To briefly summarize the two main points, there is something in art that speaks to us, but cannot be deciphered rationally and remains an enigma. Similarly, creating a work of art implies making space for this element. An artist can use the aesthetic means at her, his disposal, style, technique, or also knowledge of schools, of currents, or traditions to channel this element, bring it to the forefront, and so give it the space it needs. From the above rendering, two insights can be gleaned. What follows first of all is that the aesthetic can be used to give a certain shape to that other element, which I would once more identify as the energetic. The aesthetic so gives direction and form, yet the outcome will always be co-determined by the energetic. There so is space for a rational willing, but it has to be let go of and faded at one point in the process. This leads, secondly, to a conceptualization of art in its relation to science and crafts. And it is indeed at this point that I differentiate my stand from Theodor Adorno when he points out that art always remains in critical tension to science and that the two categories should not be fused. Taking into account what has been established about the relation between the rational aesthetic, Apollonian element, and that other element, the Dionysian or energetic, within heart, it can be asserted in critical distinction now from Adorno that the conception of the relation between art and science here is not a dualism, but neither is it a dialectic. Contrary to a dialectic relationship between art and science, the art of the self can only be a weak art. Following Gianni Vattimo's dissolution of dialectics in a thinking of difference, such a weak art also contains traces and elements of the rational and aesthetic of science and theory. It is furthermore not science or rationality as such that needs to be rejected in an art of the self, but only rationality's pull towards purity and the drive towards a pure Apollonian form that is to be resisted. It is through attempting to be only rational that science disengages itself from art and its Dionysian qualities. If, however, the Apollonian is to be once more related to the Dionysian, then the rational element in heart 
and heart cannot be denied either. It rather needs to be included and given its own space. That space will of course be different from the position rationality occupied in the purely Apollonian striving for hegemony. But still, the Apollonian quality cannot be denied. The art of the self is thus, in parts, also a twisted, distorted, verwunden in science. Unlike in the dialectical understanding, the Apollonian and Dionysian science and art are so mutually transposed into each other and partially fused, performing an intimate dance of creation. One could subsequently, and without contradiction also, turn this weak proposition around and posit the art of the self not as an art containing elements of a science, but just as well as a science which is also an art. It is in this instance only a matter of where the greater stress is placed, and which of the two elements is emphasized and highlighted in its qualities. In a weak proposal, both the Apollonian and the Dionysian are inherent to art and science. And indeed, the image with which the first chapter closed, that is, the Nietzschean picture of a musical Socrates, suggests exactly that. It evokes the idea of a scientific mind, which is also at the same time an artist, without clearly distinguishing between them in an either-or. With Friedrich Nietzsche, one can so assert that the art of the self might also be thought of as a gay science. If this is understood as a science which embraces its Dionysian element, takes into account the qualities of an art of living, and therefore becomes a science which is not heavy and ponderous in its rational musing, a science which is beyond the purity of formal moralities and which thus sings and sizzles with energy. It is this life-affirming quality which, taking rationality into account, but ultimately moving beyond rationality, could turn the art of the self into a gay science of light feet that is capable of perceiving thinking as dancing. Nietzsche. It is in this weak twisting together of art and science that the art of the self becomes a transrational art. Indeed, in light of what we have just affirmed. This art of the self could not be anything other but weak and transrational, because any strong thinking will, as we have established in the first chapter, always lead back to the purity of form. In this interplay between the rational aesthetic and the energetic elements, which makes for an art of the transpersonal self, it is, as will be examined, on several examples in further chapters, entirely possible to stress more one or the other element, making this work of transformation lean more towards a science or an art. The concrete shape such an art of the self will take, consequently also depends on personal preference and the situational necessities. It is always local and contingent, and will in each instant take a different and new venue, as it depends on the current interplay of the Apollonian and Dionysian, and the strength and form of the aesthetic in its entanglement with the energetic. If in this instance I have chosen to name this study an art of the transpersonal self, then this is therefore an expression of such personal preference. It is intended to accentuate this crucial transrational element, for which I believe using the concept of science would not appear so evocative. It might also be argued that to stress the Dionysian quality might be more the necessity of the day, since the situation we are faced with at present seems to be leaning strongly towards an Apollonian hegemony and suppression of the Dionysian. Providing a counterweight to restore a balance might therefore carry some merit. Still, I would like to assert that the art of the self could just as well be conceptualized through placing the stress differently as a gay science. 
the often belabored separation between the realms of art and science so turns into a difference of graduation and shades rather than a difference of principle as the one is always already inherent in the other here a distinction can be made which has already been hinted at previously and the following knowing shall be called the result of rational cognition which is also open to theory we shall furthermore identify as understanding that other form of perceiving the one which derives not from a rational grasping but from intuition and is thus only to a certain limit open to theorizing and can ever only be realized in the form of an experiential encounter the aim owing to the conceptualization of the art of the transpersonal self as a weak proposal is a so weak understanding one that does not completely disavow its rational counterpart but much more acknowledges that for intuition and understanding knowledge plays a certain role as well once more it is emphasized that it is not the apollonian as such that needs to be resisted but only its striving for pure forms at the same time it shall also not be hidden here what the use of understanding and intuition in this meaning implies Quote, intuition is strictly bound to the metaphysical concept of evidence of bringing an inner illumination into the open of gathering first principles Fatimo. With this weak form of intuition and understanding, but also with the current use of enigmaticalness and the transrational, the field of something very similar to metaphysics opens up again. The question of whether it is indeed a new metaphysics that is approached here will need to be addressed. As the discussion is now leaning to a different point, I want to leave this question open for now, but we'll return to it in chapter 7. Finally, there is one further element which relates this figure of an art sketch so far to the overall topic of relevance in this work. Let's briefly recall Adorno's concept of enigmaticalness and his assertion that as a beholder one is never finished with a work of art and that a new question presents itself each time one understands it on one level. This lends itself to the assumption that something in the self changes as one continues to engage with art, that one becomes different as one engages with a piece of art. It is this transformative quality of art which echoes, relates to the project of envisioning a transformative practice of the self. Michel Foucault explicitly asserts this transformative element in both the field of art and the work on the self, with the question, why should a painter work if he is not transformed by his own painting? It is in this quality of the arts to affect a shift and thus give the possibility of becoming other, in which one also recognizes the work on the self as belonging to that very same category. With such an understanding of art, one can then turn through the continuous, transformative, aesthetic and energetic practice, also the own life, into a work of art. 3.2. The object of art. Once more, it is necessary to pause for a moment and introduce another distinction and another question, that of the object of art. In the colloquial use of the term, a work of art is an object, a thing, something that is created by an artist. The material to be worked on is external. Even if this piece of work is intricately connected to the artist or himself, commonly an artist is still distinguished by the works of art he she creates and not by whichever transformative effects the act of creating might have had on the person persons engaged in the process. The object of art in this understanding can so be material, as for example in the case of a film, photograph, painting, sculpture, or immaterial, music. 
imaginistic or non-imaginistic. In all these cases, however, an artist remains defined by the object she he creates. The object of art is extrinsic. The art of the self differs from this concept insofar as the material to be worked is the own life and the own self. Michel Foucault heralds this idea with the following question, quote, What strikes me is the fact that in our society, Heart has become something that is related only to objects and not to individuals or to life. That art is something which is specialized or done by experts who are artists. But couldn't everybody's life become a work of art? Why should the lamp or the house be an art object but not our life? Such an understanding of art shifts the focus of what counts as a work of art, and also of who can be an artist. The material to be worked on is the own life, the own self, which is to be given a certain form and style. An artist is consequently somebody who attempts to transform her himself. This in turn has four consequences. First. The practice of art no longer culminates in a finished piece of work, but is an ongoing, lifelong preoccupation, something with which one never is finished. Art understood in this manner is a process, not a product. Secondly, it wrests the idea of art away from being the single preoccupation of the so-called gifted few or celebrated creative geniuses who supposedly have a special talent which sets them apart. The art of the self, quite simply, consists in a daily practice, in the daily affirmation of life, and in the possibility to become differently which arises from this affirmation. The art of the self can be practiced by everybody. Everybody can become an artist of the self. Thirdly, as Foucault points out, this work of an art of the self usually does not have an audience. It is a work on the self. No, it is a work of the self, on the self, by and for the self. It is, quote, an activity, the subject's constant action on himself, which finds its reward in a certain relationship of the subject to himself. One saves oneself for the self. One is saved by the self. One saves oneself in order to arrive at nothing other than oneself. Foucault. The difference such an art of the self could make will matter only for oneself and the concrete people around, those with whom one is in situational relationality. But fortly and conversely, with this understanding of art, the stakes are also raised. An artist now is somebody who risks the home transformation, who enters the creative process in order to change oneself, to change what one has been towards the indeterminate horizon of new becomings, with uncertain outcome and an open future. No results are guaranteed in this game. In this Foucauldian perception, the actual creation of an object so takes a back seat and most of the time will be completely absent. This does not imply that creating such an object cannot be part of a transformation of the self. But even in this case, the emphasis is placed differently. The process of creation, the writing, painting, composing, etc then is deployed as a tool, as a technology, at the end of which one hopes to emerge transformed. The permanent process of transformation becomes the goal, and creating an external work of art turns into a possible means toward this end. One can so conclude and draw together the findings of this section in the following way. I first conceptualized with Theodore Adorno, enigmaticalness, as an expression of the Dionysian pole in any work of art. 
raising the question of a relation of art to science and crafts. Secondly, a certain stylistic, rational element of work inherent in any artistic expression was discerned. However, this aesthetic element is always coupled with and transfigured by an energetic component. In fact, it is only this combination which lets a work of art appear in its interplay. Thirdly, it so became possible to distinguish the conceptualization of the relation between art and science from a dualistic or dialectic view and to assert with Gianni Vattimo the understanding of art as weak. That is, simultaneously containing elements of Apollonian rationality as well as elements of Dionysian energy. Fourthly, this led towards retaking a topic from the first chapter. Via the Nietzschean figure of the musical Socrates, it was possible to open the path towards conceptualizing this art of the self, alternatively also as a gay science. The theoretical insight gained here was, fifthly, that the concrete manifestation of the art of the self might, depending on the specific interplay of the Apollonian and Dionysian, at times lean more towards an art or more towards a science. It is a question of situational choice and contextual conditions. Sixthly, one still gets closer to the differentiation between understanding and knowing, asserting a form of weak understanding as appropriate for an art of the transpersonal self and thus opening the question of the metaphysical. Seventhly, the transformative quality of art was linked to a similar characteristic of the practice of the self, thus completing the rendering of the aesthetic and energetic practice of the self as an art of the self. The aim of an art of the self was finally distinguished from the common modern use of art. The aim of the art of the self is not the creation of an extrinsic object, but the transformation of the self through a risky process, which does not culminate in a finished piece of work, but continues perpetually throughout one's life. 3.3. A life in transformation. Quote, we others, we immoralists, have conversely made room in our hearts for every kind of understanding, comprehending and approving. We do not easily negate we make it a point of honor to be affirmers. Nietzsche. If what has been outlined in the past chapters holds merit, then there is a certain idea of subjectivity or self that arises thereof. With Michel Foucault, an assessment has been given of different forms of subjectivation in ancient Greece. One main difference between the Platonic model and the Christian model on the one hand, and the Hellenistic on the other is that unlike the former two, the latter does not presuppose an essence, soul, strong, truth of the self. The practice of the self espoused by the Hellenistic model is thus one of actively fashioning the own self, as opposed to unhearthing the truth about oneself, or remembering what the soul has seen previously in the realm of ideal forms. If one follows this Hellenistic model further, then a consequence is that subjectivity is no longer envisioned as a stable being, but on the contrary, engaged in an unending flow of becoming. The form which the self takes does not remain the same. Heraclitus was one of the first to conceptualize this understanding of the self, as in transformation by asserting that it would be impossible for the same person to step into the same river twice. In the second attempt of entering, after time has passed, one would no longer be the same person, and also the waters of the river have changed, making it different as well. Stepping into that river, one is thus neither the same person, nor is it the same river. Bowl. Radicalizing this thought, Heraclitus' student, Cratylus, points out that it is also quite impossible to step into the same river once. Augusto Bull summarizes this view. 
his pupil Cratylus, even more radical, would say to his teacher that nobody can go into a river even once, because upon going in, the waters of the river are already moving. Which waters would he enter? And the person who would attempt it would already be aging. Who would be entering, the older or the younger one? Now, what this outline points to is the impossibility of remaining the same person. Unlike portrayed in the platonic rendering, what is encountered here is not an essence which needs to be found in an act of remembrance, and neither is it the Christian truth about oneself that needs to be deciphered, but a perpetual, unceasing flow of changes in which subjectivation takes place. This finding connects with the view ascribed to the Hellenistic model in the last chapter. For those ancient practitioners of the interplay of the care of the self and the knowledge of the self, it was apparent that with each breath we take, we become other than who we are. Quote, Whenever we breathe, we give up a little of our pneuma and take in a little of, of another pneuma, so that the pneuma is never the same. And inasmuch as we have a pneuma, we are never the same and consequently could not fix our identity in this. Foucault As long as we breathe, as long as we take in the air from around us, let it spread in our body and then exhale it again, we will not remain the same. Indeed, at this very moment the question arises, where do we begin and end? With each breath we become porous and blur around the edges. Where does the pneuma exhaled stop being a part of us, and at which point? In the respiratory process, can the air inhale no longer be separated from us and becomes a part of ourselves? Through this inhaling and exhaling, a small, perhaps infinitesimally small, but still unavoidable change takes place. Our breath transforms us. In chapter 6, it will be explicated how this fact can be turned into a practice of the self. Life so turns into a perpetual becoming, in which a stable being is impossible. Nietzsche succinctly sums it up in the phrase that whatever has being does not become, whatever becomes does not have being. Life, in this sense, implies becoming. Wolfgang Schirmacher, in a similar vein, asserts that the human condition always has implied a becoming including a becoming human, which can be thought of as open-handed, as never coming to a conclusion. Following Martin Heidegger, Luigi and Ivatimo, being becomes an act of remembrance, that which reveals itself only in its absence. Being turns into something that always already is in the past, as something recalled, and is therefore never fully established as a presence. Identity, understood as remaining self-identical from one moment to the next, is then a misnomer, for one always is, in part, not identical to and different from oneself. What has been said so far has three main consequences. In a perpetual stream of becoming, firstly, a large part of what is happening to the self, remains beyond its grasp and certainly beyond its cognitive willing. Transformation, becoming, takes place in any case, whether willed or not. Nietzsche, taking this thought one step further, points out the ultimate conclusion of this insight, namely that the cognitive willing might not be necessary at all, indispensable for transformation and becoming to take place. The will no longer moves anything, hence does not explain anything either. It merely accompanies events. It can also be absent. Transformation occurs anyhow and is independent of conscious reflection, unlike assumed in the modern idea of a rational self-grounding subjectivity. In this view, becoming can happen independently of the consciously reflecting and willing I. The cogito is no longer ultimate foundation of the self and master in the home house, but something merely added on. 
Secondly, it means that the self possibly might also have much less coherence than is usually attributed to it in the Cartesian tradition, formed as it is in the interplay of different influences beyond our cognition. Instead of a coherent structure ordered by a rational mind, Nietzsche posits the interplay of drives struggling for supremacy. Two paths lead further on from this. One leads via Sigmund Freud's theory of the drives into psychoanalysis and the concept of the unconscious. The other one turns via Michel Foucault towards an art of the self. What this common foundation suggests is also that those different roads may not be as separated and incommensurable as commonly perceived. For Foucault, the history of the self begins with the first active attempts at becoming, with the first practices in which the subject attempts to transcend itself towards becoming something differently. Since the self, in Foucault's rendering, is a historical phenomenon and not pre-established in its essential being, this implies that the self has a beginning and can thus have an ending, like for example when it transforms into something different. Thereof thirdly derives the conclusion that what one has already become is by no means an ending point. This insight brings Nietzsche and Foucault to the creative attempt to envision what one might yet become. I will recur to this point in more detail in the section of the next chapter entitled An Affirmative Practice. With that, the threshold to an understanding of the importance of an art of the self is reached. If change is inevitable, if it is impossible to stay the same, if furthermore this change occurs not through cognitive willing but in a transrational and transpersonal process, of which one is often quite unaware, then the question of the art of the self, how to still give one's life a certain shape, how to elicit a change towards the subjectively better, becomes preeminent. Transformation, change, becoming, all take place in any case. The question then becomes as to how one can shape this procedural becoming in its Apollonian Dionysian entanglement. One of the main aims of this book is to shed further light on this question. To resume our reflections, it can furthermore be assumed that both Nietzsche and Foucault posit struggle or conflict as one of the main causes for transformation. The notion of transformation often becomes urgent when there is a challenge, something in the self or one's relational surroundings that causes irritations, that shafts. This idea of what instigates transformation is also echoed in Heraclitus, in his famous polemic about war as the father of all things. In a very similar vein, Nietzsche stipulates that one has renounced the great life when one renounces war. Foucault asserts in an inversion of close wits that politics is the continuation of war by other means. Light can be shed on those statements if they are read on the basis of the above assumption that struggle, conflict, can be the basis for affirmative transformation and becoming. By taking a closer look at those statements, it so becomes possible to interpret them beyond their seemingly belligerent attitude. On the example of Nietzsche's statement, it can first be asserted that to say that to renounce war means to renounce the great life begs at least two interpretive questions. One asking about what the great life could possibly mean, and the second raising the question of war. What then might first the great life be? if Nietzsche is read in light of the above. The great life, I would argue, is first the affirmative life. It is a life that celebrates existence and also affirms itself. It is 
the life which, instead of just letting subjectivation happen, tries to also actively engage in a practice and fashioning of the self. This affirmative life so actively undertakes the always risky venture of becoming other. Such an undertaking, however, has secondly a twisting moment. For this affirming, active element can no longer consist in the aggressive stance of a cognitive willing, but has to make room for that other, energetic element of subjectivation, and also include at one point a letting go of everything that has been aspired to or already achieved. Such an art of the self does has to become transrational. It implies not to cling to the single elements in this constant flow of becoming, but to let them stream away. This great life could thus be the always risky undertaking of a weak affirmation. An affirmation that celebrates the active moment of becoming, but also acknowledges the imperfection of those moments and the necessity to let go of them at the crucial juncture. In the terminology of Wolfgang Schirmacher, such an affirmation is what marks the crucial difference between homo generator and homo compensator. The latter strives for perfection and is constantly looking for flaws to purge in order to overcome the own inadequacy. Homo compensator wants to recognize the own shortcomings for the sole purpose of eliminating them. That man is his own wolf, even at times his own worst enemy. That profound mistrust and feeling of inadequacy poison his life, and depression overshadows it. These situations are supposed to disappear just as physical disease, or in the most outrageous demand, death, are supposed to be done away with. The life of Homo generator, however, like the Nietzschean great life, is one that is characterized by acknowledging also the own imperfections, not with dread and a fearful feeling of insufficiency, but on the contrary, with callous and height, releasement. From this vantage point, the drive to perfection can be let go of, as our inherent imperfections are acknowledged and affirmed as well. This great life is so not the striving for control and security, but on the contrary, the letting go of control and embracing of insecurity through a weak assertion of one's own existence. The great life is not mainly to be found in the striving for the extraordinary, the greater achievement or more spectacular feat. It is neither a gesture of vanity understood at that which tries to hold on to its moments of perceived greatness and is so unable to let go and relinquish the striving for control. It is much rather to be found in the small daily gestures, in everyday life, and so to speak, in each breathing in and breathing out. And this in turn brings us to the second part of Nietzsche's statement. Namely, that such a great life cannot renounce war. If this war, Nietzsche insists upon is read with Walter Kaufmann, metaphorically, and is understood as an expression of the conflictive element inherent in human life, then we can agree with Nietzsche that renouncing this war implies exactly aspiring to security and control, which in turn makes a transformation of the self impossible. Such a renunciation implies negating the conflictive element in life as potential source for creative energy. This great life is not the impervious gesture that wards off all influences, and neither is it the prevention nor negation of conflicts. It is much to the contrary to be found in the acknowledgement of conflicts as positive and potentially creative parts of human existence. This life, therefore, is also always insecure, 
as opening oneself to transformation through conflict has no guaranteed outcome and always also means letting oneself be transformed. Now, not to be mistaken, with this understanding, the possibility of an individual ethics that rescinds war as violence can still be retained. It is, however, the expression of a position that first can no longer be universalized towards a morality, and that secondly embraces this war if it is understood as struggle, as sometimes painful conflict, towards a chance of transformation of oneself. Relating the topic of transformation to the Apollonian Dionysian interplay, Friedrich Nietzsche explicitly associates the active moment of transformation and relationality with the Dionysian element and sketches a Dionysian extreme. Quote, it is impossible for the Dionysian type not to understand any suggestion. He does not overlook any signs of effect. He possesses the instinct of understanding and guessing in the highest degree, just as he commands the art of communication in the highest degree. He enters into any skin, into any effect. He constantly transforms himself. Nietzsche. The Dionysian can so be perceived as the art of disindividuation and relational opening experienced in a moment of transfiguration and indeterminacy. This Dionysian element can thus foster a liberating becoming, can open venues for change, but ultimately also needs to be coupled with the channeling effects of Apollonian bounding. A completely Dionysian life seems to be unlivable, but with that the question of how much bounding how much Apollo one is willing to take in stride has not yet been answered. And indeed, at its limit point, the question arises if the transcendence or hand of subjectivity might not be encountered in the Dionysian experience. Might not the transcendence of subjectivation be thought of as a series of unboundings, transcending individuality? It is clear that this transcendence cannot be achieved via the other extreme of an Apollonian hegemony, which denies the life-affirming power of transformation. Inherent in the Apollonian hegemony, there remains the striving for security and control, as the attempt to create an absolute position, a position sine cura, without care, without preoccupation. Martinez which ultimately rejects the Dionysian aspect of the relational transformation of human existence and is once more guided by the thinking of a strong truth. 3.4 Conclusion This chapter is comprised of two main parts. And the first one, dealing with the question of the practice of the self as art. Firstly, the art of the transpersonal self was discerned to be a weak art deriving out of the interplay between the Apollonian and Dionysian. From this rendering as weak art, it followed, secondly, that the art of the transpersonal self might just as well be perceived as a gay, weak science. This rendering as art, thirdly, makes the practice of the self compatible with the findings of both previous chapters. The practice of the self as art is in line with both the Dionysian Apollonian, aesthetic energetic, picture of the first, and the double practice of philosophy spirituality, knowledge of the self and care of the self, given in the second chapter. The figure of art highlights the element of performing a work on oneself while at the same time, it also contains that transrational element which is so crucial for both the Apollonian Dionysian and philosophy spirituality. Conceptualizing transformative practices as art, thus, makes it possible to retain all those different meanings and possible forms of expression. A specific practice, a concrete art of the self, can so focus more on the Apollonian aesthetic philosophical or on the Dionysian energetic spiritual aspect while still maintaining the relationality, 
mutual conditioning and balancing of those two, and therefore avoid falling back into a dualism or dialectic. A necessity that has yet not been tended to in this work so far is to make visible what form such an art of the self could take. This will be the topic of chapter 6. In the last pages, fourthly, the understanding of subjectivation has been further differentiated. At the base of this subjectivation, an understanding of life in constant transformation was discerned. This perpetual process of transformation, fifthly, implies a self in permanent becoming, which makes being possible only as absence, as an act of remembrance of that which is never fully present. Sixthly, this led to a problematization of the concept of the self as a coherent, rationally willing agent. If becoming through transformation, seventhly, is an unavoidable feature of human life, then the question of how to actively shape this becoming poses itself with renewed urgency. Hence arises the necessity for an art of the self. With Friedrich Nietzsche, I then established that this art of the self could realize itself as great life in a life-affirming practice, which in the form of a weak affirmation celebrates the active moments of becoming, but is also able to let those active elements fade at a crucial moment of letting go. The transformation of the self, ninthly, always happens in and through conflict. Conflict is perceived as an unavoidable and often creative part of human existence. It is only through embracing conflict that the possibility for an active transformation of the self opens up at all. The different features of relationality, permanent becoming, and subjectivity as form now add up to a certain understanding of the self which needs to be further addressed in the next chapter. The question that derives is the one about the meaning of transpersonality. This problem already has clearly surfaced at the end of the second chapter and can now, after those intermediary moves, be addressed in the next chapter. Why transpersonality? And what could this possibly entail? In how far does the transpersonal self differ from the concept of a clear-cut, singular subjectivity? And what does this imply for the project of actively giving one's life a certain style in an aesthetic and energetic practice? <laughs>